Hello world. I, y'all have tuned in to another episode of The Stone Show presented by Active. And this time, this one is sponsored by The Pruitts with State Realty. Uh, this episode is called um, um, Desperate People Do Desperate Things, Spiritual Awareness. And today I have a special guest with me. You know, she's, uh, we go way back. You know, we go way back to where I used to do poetry and, and dance on Cotton Street. And, um, you know, uh, she's very dear to me, a very, very close friend. Uh, you know, she's always been um, there for me if I call. She'll answer the phone. If she don't, she'll call me back. Um, you know, uh, she showed me many things for us um, spiritual wise. She's also uh, helped me find the person that I am today for is my Islamic state and uh, believing the things that I believe in, whether it's reading my Quran or reading my Bible or rather believing in myself and my self-awareness. Uh, today I have, a, like I said, a special guest, you know, uh, many people know her, many people don't. And I hope today that she enlightened you guys about uh, different things that uh, she's gone through uh, or different goals that she has in life and um, accomplishments that she has accomplished. And um, I hope that uh, today that you get something out of this episode that you didn't get out of the other one and it manifests you to look higher, deeper within self and make your spirit aware of the different things that's going on around the world, um, in the spiritual realms, in the heavens or in the hells. Um, today I have with me Miss Latifah Pruitt the wonderful, beautiful Miss Latifah Pruitt. And um, Miss uh, Pruitt, I want, uh, it's, it's been said around, you know, I cut straight to the point. I'm gonna roll my sleeves up on yes, this one. I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut straight to, and get right to the business. It's a bunch of people around here say that, hey, um, because of the cars you drive now, and um, the different accomplishments that your family has put together and struggled to make that y'all were born with silver spoons and this, that, and that. Could you please inform these people who you are, where you come from, and a little bit more about yourself? Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, peace, bro. It's good to see you. Um, I, um, I'm Latifah Pruitt. I grew up, born and raised Longview, Texas, Davis Street, 300 block, 301 to be exact. Um, I don't know where that silver spoon comes from, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm glad that people have that perception that they want to have it because it shows that, that the uh, process that we went through, we did it with grace and, uh, but, uh, growing up, you know, there were plenty of struggles that we had, um, we were uh, a business. My, my parents both got laid off and that's how they actually got into the real estate business. My father got laid off from Exxon and my mother got laid off. And so they both decided to go into real estate. So we went through that process right when I was pregnant. Well, when my mom was pregnant with me. So uh, I am probably I'm that real estate baby because I was the one that was uh that was in the making while they were going through the whole real estate process. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in that, I saw them uh, not only struggle, but I seen them uh, deal with people who had that idea of them having so much that they continued to leech, you know, or, or, or to try to take from them while they struggled. And, and my parents, they're, they're a different kind because they, um, they're, they're givers. And so, um, but you know, like I said, when they, when we got into the real estate business and I say we as a family, because my parents, they utilized us as children. So we got into a lot of property management and, um, things of that sort. So on Saturdays, while everybody else was playing, we were up, they woke us up at six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. My sister and I, we cleaned the houses, my brothers, uh, they would be outside in the yard uh, doing the yard work. And we did that every Saturday. I mean, we would clean sometimes three houses every Saturday. And so, but what, what I saw with that was that instead of them paying, you know, someone else to come in and do the job, that's how they got ahead was because they utilized their children. So, <laughs> so, you know, um, I used to hate the weekends. I, I honestly hated the weekends because I knew that basically from five when we got up to six when we, once we made it to the house to five down 
uh, we were going to be working. Okay, so y'all worked for it. Oh, yes. So to, to clear the air, to make it thin, they didn't, you didn't have a silver spoon. Y'all worked as a family. Oh, yeah. I was typing contracts with a typewriter when I was six, seven years old. Typewriter. <laughs> Most of them don't know the, the little one to go, eh. Yeah. And if I messed up on that line, they'd make me start right on over. You know, I was answering the phone and from the third grade. My, uh, we, my parents bought a house and the office was next door. So we literally, I got off the bus and I went straight to the office to work. So through the desperate measures, the family pulled together exactly. and worked, exactly. which people don't do now today, because it'll be desperate measures through through, um, let's say, regular people in the hood. Mm -hmm. Joe, Bobby, Sam, this, you know, whatever. And they don't pull together, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I feel like that's really a, a part of the community that we need to work on as a whole. Mm -hmm. People in general, the mother and the father might not be together, but they need to come together and work. You know what I'm saying? And, and push each other as a family. Come together in one agreement and, and rise, mm -hmm. you know? So they can, too, their children can say that they had a silver spoon. But now that they know that you're from Davis Street, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But I had to clear that air for them because, uh, uh, like you said, in the desperate times, um, um, a desperate person is, um, in a sense of a hopeless person mm -hmm. or something that's, that's going, a hopeless situation, basically. And and it's it gets so bad that it's it it becomes impossible to deal with, and they become desperate and they do desperate things. You know what I mean? Which brings us to um, the part of the show that I really want to break down into the desperation of the lying to others. You know, the kind of the fake it to make it. You know, and um, I really want to touch on the basis real quick on that. You know how people fake it to make it? How do you really feel about people that? fake it to make it when they lie in a desperate measure i mean okay first of all i want to say like i i believe in that you shouldn't necessarily be desperate i know that there's going to be situations that are desperate situations but never try to get to that desperate point because you should always have hope Alhamdulillah. what about okay. the people that but, okay go ahead no i uh, but with that in, in mind I mean, some people have to fake it to make it if that's, if, you know, they've been taught that. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm a transparent person. So I'm going to always be honest mm -hmm. about if I'm, if I'm, if I don't have any money, I don't have any money to give you. You know what I'm saying? So you come to me, you say, hey, I want this. I don't have it to give you. But if I have it, you know, it's yours. Um, I'm not fixing to go broke trying to fake something. You know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not about, I don't care about the cars. I don't care about the clothes. I, when I was growing up, I'm going to be honest with you, I shopped at the Goodwill. That was just, I love the jackets. I love the vintage look, mm -hmm. you know, and I could go and I could get 20 outfits for like $20. But that's what I did. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, people have to do that. I'm just saying that's what I did. And I bought that myself. And I rocked it and everybody thought I looked good. That wasn't me faking it to make it. That was just me looking good being me. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm just you know, saying. You know, and uh, um, what about the desperate people that's like in search for jobs? How do you feel about the ones that um, sells drugs or sell their self for sex or whatnot? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there's another way for them or whatnot? Uh, because the desperation part of that, you know, mm -hmm. like, People like, I went to prison and got out, you know, I'm not ashamed of it. You know, I got me a job and I worked at Dollar Tree and I only make this much. Mm -hmm. And um, some people feel like that, hey man, I'm not working, I'm not doing that, or I'm not doing that. And um, uh, just touch on the basis of how you feel about that, because I know you work for your mom now mm -hmm. or whatnot, but how do you feel about the ones that are uh, in search for jobs and those desperate measures? Give them a kind of insight of how to get up and go get it, basically, uh -huh. I guess. I, okay, the, Erica Badu's uh, this song, Other Side of the Game, you know, I understand the game sometimes. So sometimes I get it and sometimes I don't, but um, I didn't always work for my parents. You know, I had a career prior to uh, coming back to Longview and working for my parents. Which was what? I did a couple of things. I worked as a PBX operator at JCPenney. Okay. And uh, my first job when I left, well, first of all, I worked, as a kid for my parents, but I also played the piano for a church while I was in high school. Okay, so I've always worked. Okay. I bought my first car by playing the piano at church on Sundays. A lot of people didn't know that, you know, I did that, but I did. Um, but 
When I went off to college, I did people's resumes, I did people's hair, I would cook and sell five dollar plates. You know, I was, I, my dad made me get my notary license. I was doing notaries for uh, the students in college and sometimes even the professors. So, um, you know, I just had to find different avenues of doing things. And then um, eventually I started working as an a intern. But even when I worked for an intern uh, for a record label, mm -hmm. I still wasn't getting paid. I was getting the experience, but I wasn't getting paid. So I had to keep my job as the operator at JCPenney. I also did work study at the school. So, you know, uh, it's, it's about you just trying to find your way, okay. you know, and I'm not, I'm not mad at people who, um, who, you know, feel like they have to go the illegal route. Mm -hmm. I just would pray and hope that they have a plan on getting out of it. Okay. You know, the escape plan, basically, <laughs> you know. But mm -hmm. I understand. What, what about the uh, district measures that uh, resorts to violence mm -hmm. uh, um, to try to prove a point? Do you think there that there's ways around that or or do you think that it's necessary and have to be done? Well, you said something in the previous episode that I watched mm -hmm. about anger, how it's like a second, you know, it's always secondary mm -hmm. to that first thing. So I think we pretty much have to know ourselves you know that's that's something that a person has to do to get in tune with who they are okay. and what makes them do the things that they do uh, especially with your ego because I know there have been situations where you know I really just had to do everything in my power mm -hmm. to just you know chill and walk away you know <laughs> but you know because a lot of people they think oh she she's not you know they know they know I have something to lose mm -hmm. So they'll try me all the time, you know, but at the same time, I've learned from the experiences that I've had. Say, for instance, I, I was bullied one time by this by this young lady. And uh, I remember everybody. <laughs> this was in middle school. I was in sixth oh, grade. Oh, she mean, y'all. She mean. <laughs> so uh, everybody was, you know, you know how everybody runs around about to fight and everything. My cousin gave me this pencil. And he said, if she try to fight you, you better stab her with this pencil. So me, being a person I am, I'm like, but I'm going to give her lead poisoning. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to give her lead poisoning. So as she was like, that's OK. At the uh, end of school, I'm going to get you. So I came home. I went home. And I walked to the office. And uh, my mom knew something was wrong. She knew something was wrong. She was like, I'm taking you to that school. We're going to find out what happened. So whatever happened, uh, between uh, my mom finding out who the girl was and her going to that house. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next day, the girl came to me and she was nice as nice can be. I think I think what ended up happening was my, my mom was the ended up being the landlord or something hmm. to, to, you know, she she lived in my parents. But I didn't know that, you know, <laughs> so she ended up coming and she was the nicest person to me. But that's the thing, you know, you just never know who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So I've been always that person where I let I let things happen as they come and then, you know, eventually you'll see, like that person did me wrong, but eventually you'll see the repercussions of that. Kind of like the saying, they let God fight your battles. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Come on, man. But, but that's something you have to learn because if, what if I would have stabbed it with that pen, pencil? Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Maybe she got lead poison. You know that. You know, you wouldn't be where you are today. I would not. Be <laughs> I'd be still probably fight. <laughs> Because I know that, uh, you know, y'all do real estate and y'all are realtors. And um, it's a people out here that are in search for homes and um, the signing of the contracts for the homes. Um, uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm not a realtor or anything. Like when I rent it, I rent it from y'all. I'm like, hey, man, I just pay my rent. But could you kind of break down for to the people, for the people, for all the people, you know, not just for, you know, for all the people, uh, what these contracts really are? and what they're assigning, like, you know, the leases or whatnot. Could you kind of break down what you're assigning whenever you're doing these things? Uh, basically, it's just an agreement mm -hmm. uh, that where you are agreeing to pay someone a certain amount of money to live there for a certain amount of time, and you agree and abide by the rules and the standards that they put forth in the lease. That's basically what it is. Um, uh, now, 
a lot of people want to go on that rent versus own. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I'm gonna always say, of course, you know, you should go towards the ownership part. But if you're going to rent, you what you need to realize is that that rent is really like a bargain for you to get a house because they're gonna look at your rental history mm -hmm. when you're purchasing a home. So so. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real good and you can actually have your uh, your landlord write a letter, uh, a letter, a line of credit for you in some banks and they'll accept that showing how you paid your rent on time. And the landlord is the person that rents the land and the building or the apartments to the tenant, correct? Right. And the tenant is the person that is doing the rent. Exactly. And the landlord is the person that actually owns the home? Yes, the landlord is the person that owns the home and sometimes the landlord hires a property manager who manages the property for the landlord. Okay, why, why are they called landlords? Uh, because they're the lord of the land. Lord of the <laughs> land. That's right. <laughs> the yeah. lord of the land. The lord of the, the land. Like the lord of the land. Lord mm -hmm. in my vocabulary is like the higher power, the gods. Well, they own. They basically own the rights. And, and that's, that's not necessarily an English uh, term. That's more of... Uh, that came from like a uh, British uh, type term, you know, the, how they use Lord and, and that sort of thing. Because Lord meaning the higher power. So right. they're the higher person that's over this right. land. OK, OK. So uh, um, what are the thoughts of having a landlord versus uh, being the landlord? Uh, well, first of all, Texas is a landlord state. That's one thing that people have to realize. A lot of times when you go to eviction court, uh, a tenant will have uh, all this long list of, of items of reasons why they shouldn't be evicted. But at the end of the day, you're not going to win. If you're not paying your rent or if that landlord wants to get you out, you got to go. Because, like I said, Texas is a landlord state and it's going to be in the favor of that landlord. Now, with this CARES Act that had went on, what I, I really was kind of frustrated at some people because they were talking about how you know, you won't have to pay your rent, you know, right now because, uh, you know, the CARES Act or whatever. But I, I didn't want people to not understand that there will come a time when all of that's going to be due at once. Okay. So I did not like how people were just expressing you don't have to pay your rent, but they weren't expressing the fact that it's going to be due in full and you got to pay it in full. So but but yeah, so. Um, being a landlord, um, it's hassles to that too. <laughs> you know, you know, you can be. People always say it's a, the the tenant can give you a hard time, basically. You know, and 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 it's it's real hard sometimes to please some some of these tenants. But but um, for the most part, uh, and unless you one of these slum lords or something like that, I think I think the landlord tenant relationship. Is is really it's it's a good thing. It's a balanced thing. You you you're you're paying your rent. The landlord is providing you with a place to live, and and really that balance should be something that could that should be agreeable. Mm -hmm. So this lease option it gives you the right to um, rent the home, the, uh, but not buy. No no, and and that's the thing about six seven eight years ago. Lease to own and rent to own was becoming really, really popular. You don't find that too much now. You find owner financing now because what people found out, what the owners found out was you can't use the same strategy to evict someone when you do a rent to own that you can do when they're just renting. So it's a longer process. You have to actually have to go through a foreclosure process and that can take a longer time and it takes more money. So that's why you don't see as many rent to owns and lease to owns now as you did so back that's, in the day. So that comes when you have the eviction from the three days to the 30 days, basically? Uh, no, that's, that's renting. Mm -hmm. But when you're renting to own, a foreclosure could take up to three months, sometimes six months. So Without paying? Without paying. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, that's what I'm saying. So that's why you don't find it as much. That's why people do owner financing now to where you're going to pay that larger down payment. Therefore, you're not going to lose. You're, not, you're more than likely not going to mess up if you put $20,000 down on something. 
versus you paying a deposit of five hundred dollars. OK, and uh, earlier you said, of course, you would tell the people to lean towards more renting to own or to buying. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, why? I mean, what is the importance of some people? Because I know some people that now they just pay rent till they die. I mean, explain to these people why it'd be good to to own your home. Well, it's generational wealth. It's something that you can pass down to to your children. Uh, it's something that where if I purchase this home and I decide I want to move somewhere else, I can either sell this home or I can continue to generate income by renting it. And, and basically, you know, that rent can either finish paying off this home or if you're finished paying off that, it can help you pay off the home that you're moving into. You know, it's generational wealth, is is airship, being able to pass something down. And I'm going to tell you an example, like say for instance with me. Growing up, I used to, you know, I was, I don't want to say a pageant girl, but I was one of these people, I won all these po popularity contests and all that kind of stuff. But it didn't make me happy. You know, and then when I went on to work with the, the uh, music companies and everything, and I saw all these artists with all these awards, and I saw them, and they would win these awards, and next thing you know, they're not happy, you know, they're on to the next thing. So what I gained from that was, Instead of these titles behind my name, I want my name written on titles. So, so I look more towards owning something versus just having, uh, you know, something behind my name. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you don't want an Oscar. You want a Pruitt Award. I want, <laughs> I want a Pruitt City. Oh. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, I want the block, you know, I want, I want, the, I, I want, I want, that's what I want. You know, if, if I get recognized for it, if I get acknowledged for it, that doesn't matter to me because with, with that recognition and all that comes other things, but nobody will know if I bought something unless I tell them. Oh, I'm doing a lot. I'm going to tap into this and tap out of it. All right. Because uh, even with uh, you telling us about all the realtors and um, buying the houses, owning and rent. And uh, I really hope that people at home really got something out of it. I want to tap on the uh, subject real quick of the Section 8s mm -hmm. and um, um, how women as uh, men or elderly will move into the Section 8s mm -hmm. and they don't move out, you know, and uh uh, I just want to know, I want you to kind of break, do you know anything more about that? Like, uh, how does this Section 8 thing work with the government? Are they moving into them? Are they like paying the rent to the government or whatnot? Is it a realtant thing or uh, how does that work? Well, just real briefly, because I don't want to touch too much on it. Um, I think that what it is is that people, when they have hardships mm -hmm. and they do go for assistance, then they sometimes, depending on what that hardship is, you know, they have some type of schedule that they use where depending on what it is and how much they are making that um, they pay a portion or they sometimes the government pays all, you know, they get this assistance. But um, uh, to my understanding, most of the people that I know, they do work you know, that are receiving it, they just are having some hardships. Yeah, because I was, uh, the reason I touched on that because the word that you're using is hardships. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was, uh, also brought this show up to show people that you didn't have a silver spoon, where you came from and you worked for it. And um, I know some, uh, it's a friend of mine, and I'm not gonna say his name. It's a friend of mine that lives in the section eight and that's just where he stays. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to move, you know, and um, it's more like, hey, you use it for your hardship to gain, to stack. So you can see that there's people that come from the hardships, just like we come from, from the streets to where we come from, and, and, and took what the little that was given to them and built up. And um, um, most people that I know that live there, you know, of, of the color of my uh, race. And I just want to inspire you guys to let you know that uh, we can do better. And we can come together as a whole and we can do better to uh, help uplift as a family. It doesn't necessarily have to be blood like your own. It can be uh, um, family can be, hey, me, this Mexican guy, this white guy and, and this blonde head alien girl. You know, we come together as a family with one goal to strive to uplift one another, come together and say, hey, man, we want to have a car lot. 
and we can put all our little pennies together and buy this one car and fix it up and sell it and use that one car to buy another one. Life is bigger than just sitting in one spot, not having, not being able to accomplish. Uh, uh, I really want to use this podcast not only to just uh, uh, inspire you to do that, but inspire to to look deeper inside of yourself and know that uh, that the spirits are real with inside of you. Um, help help your help me help you, you know, and I also need you to help me like share follow whenever we say those things on there it's because of it's things that's being said here that need to be heard um um it might touch some of you it might not some people might like it some people might not like it you know but really at the end of the day hey if it's not for you don't watch it you know i don't watch westerns <laughs> sometimes because it's not for me and sometimes i do but uh like i said man i really want to uh, thank you for everything you've done thank but you. before we go because I know you're a very spiritual person. I want you to tap in mm-hmm. and let everybody know why you are a spiritual person. Because uh-huh. you told us where you're from yeah. and how you came up. Uh-huh. But let these people know why you are a spiritual person. Um, there's another saying that I like. It comes from a song Bilal sings about a butterfly. And the, the saying is, the struggles make you beautiful. And... It's in my struggles where I have seen the most enlightenment. And so even as a young child, my parents, especially on my mom's side, my, my, my grandmother, my aunts, my great aunts, my mama, they are like some praying warriors. Like I don't know anybody that prays or sings like, like them, I, nobody, you know? So I've always grown up with that, but um, it, was, it was at points where, like for instance, um, when I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital for three months and I could see the street that I live on. I could see where you turn onto my street. And I was there and I really didn't tell people that I was in the hospital. I kind of just dealt with it myself. I only had my cell phone. I didn't have a computer, didn't have anything. I just dealt with it. And um, some of the most prolific things that I'm doing now happened during that time with me just being me and God. You know, he gave me visions. He gave me insight. And uh, it's just it's just one of those things where I'm spiritual because I know that when I'm all alone, I have someone with me. And it's it's not something that you can necessarily just, I don't know, people used to say, listen to God, you know, like do all this, but I was like, okay, how do you hear God? How do you, how do you actually hear God? But for me, it wasn't necessary because some people actually can hear God. But for me, it was just paying attention to how things would go. And sometimes it would be immediate. Like for me, usually God speaks to me immediately after I I ask him something. But I have to be able to catch it. And if I don't catch it, I'm going to keep going through the same thing and the same thing's going to happen. And so uh, with a butterfly, when it's in its cocoon, and it turns into liquid, and then it transforms. The cocoon and everything that was inside drops to the ground and turns into dirt, and the butterfly leaves it. And that's what we do as a, as, as a spirit. You know, I, I believe that we transform. And even though I am Latifah Pruitt from Davis Street, I still have a vision of being Latifah Pruitt that owns a block. So I never, I never leave Davis Street. And let me say one more thing about Davis Street because I, I have to say this about Davis Street. I don't know if people recognize it, but the, the unity and the camaraderie that those that, that they have that we have, like you don't find that in most blocks. And I love that. And they're entrepreneurs. You know, the, forget forget what was done in the past. They, you know, they showing they true. Y'all showing out. David Street showing out. I love it. I love. I'm. I just can't help it. Everywhere I go, I have to brag on David Street. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, I, I have to. I tell everybody. You know, I'm, but I, 
I want to say that, but but um, you you have to find your quiet space. And God, to me, sounds like me a lot of times. Why? Because he's speaking through me. So I can say something and I'll be like, oh, that wasn't necessarily me saying it. That was God saying it through me. So it is what it is. I'm doing a lot. Listen, like I said, through my Islamic studies, I find out that you have your root, your coughs, and your nafs. Mm -hmm. so, you know, your root. Your root, your spirit, your coughs, your heart, your nafs, your soul. Mm -hmm. And um, through the studies, I also find out that your spirit, the reason we know that there is a higher deity or something high upon us, because that spirit that goes inside of us, it says in the, in the Bibles, the Torahs, and in, in, in the Quran, that he blew his root inside of Adam, the spirit. And that's the spiritual awareness because the spirit comes from him, it sends him. So your spirit always tries to get back to this high deity because it knows that it's something up there. Even when people do wrong, they want to do wrong the right way. Okay. You see what I'm saying? So no matter how much wrong you do, you're still trying to do wrong right. You don't want to go in the bank and drop the gun and fumble and twist it. You know, you want to rob it with perfection. And that's what the higher deity is showing you, that he's perfected. Even whenever you think you've done something wrong, sometimes it's the step of, his, of your root, of your spirit, that's leading you and guiding you once you listen to it and you're aware that you have it. That first mind that you say, I should have followed my first mind. Your root is telling you to go in this way. You know what I mean? Because that's the only part of the dirt that we're made from, or primarily, and the soul or whatever that we created ourselves that actually has seen or know that there's really a creator. With that being said, I want you to uh, tell the people how you want to be remembered. Oh, I just want to be remembered as uh, someone who has always just one, been original, oh. <laughs> and myself, and that has um, always just been available. That's my thing. I always want to be approachable. I always want to be available, and I want people to know that I, um, I'm original. I'm a creator. I believe that I'm a creator. I believe that I am always ahead. So if you see me doing something, go ahead and start doing it, because <laughs> 10 years from now, everybody's going to be doing it. Yeah, I was called the witch. You know, about when I first moved along, everyone thought I was, a, they called me a witch. They called me, you know, which was okay if you didn't think a witch was doing demonic things, mm -hmm. you know. But, you know, then, especially the women, the women just love to, you know, talk bad about me. Some of the men, I'm not going to lie, I would come, I would make it to the office and they would be, meet me at the door and say, hey, I heard you work with them herbs. You got something to clean my system? <laughs> You know, uh, so I was the hood doctor, you know, whatever. I was the root lady, you know. Yeah, I got something to clean your system. But <laughs> it got around, too, that I, I did. But, uh, but you know, now everything that I was doing, people are doing now. They're burning sage. they eat more vegetables. They're they using herbs, herbs. Yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> everything. So, so I, I just want people to, you know, to know that to not be afraid that I made them not afraid to be who they are, to do what, what, what was needed to be done because, you know, I not care about what other people say because I could have, you know, stopped or I could have just went into a shell or anything like that, but I just kept being me. Hmm. Okay, this was up. Originally, you gonna give them a poetry piece? <laughs> there you go. What? See, they don't know I that either. Ask me no, that. no, see, because y'all didn't know that. See, because we go back. When I met her, like I said, when I met her, it was all the way up third, you know. I think I was doing my uh, one of my dance songs, Walking on the Ass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And her day telling you them rooting me on this, that, and the other. And I, I was doing poetry at first, and they was looking at me like, yeah, he kind of went too deep and livening them up. You know what I'm saying? But I know y'all. Uh, uh, she, you ain't gonna give her no poetry piece. I'm not, I'm not gonna do anything, but I will say this. What? Uh, it's one of the main pieces I'm known for. <laughs> but I, I always say this some of the smartest people are from the view, and then some of the dumbest motherfuckers are from here too. So, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna be you, or are you gonna do what the others do? I'm doing a lot. <laughs> smartest people are from the view. 
It's called balance. And the dumbest ones are from here too. Which one are you? Which one are you and what you gonna do? <laughs> monkey see, monkey do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so when I say ooh, you say ooh, ooh. 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 Monkey see, monkey do. When I, I say, bet. when I say ooh, you say ooh, yeah. ooh. All right, see so you know what I'm saying? Which one you gonna be? See, I changed it up though. I said, ooh. Yeah, y'all did. I didn't do, I didn't do, ooh. Yeah, that's a, that's a feminine monkey. <laughs> oh, ooh. Well, what kind of monkey it is. Uh, once again, man, um, I want to um, thank everybody for tuning in. I hope y'all got some um, insight, uh, outlooks, and um, uh, it really touched your soul here. You know, like I said, I don't stay before you long, and um, I really want to thank Miss Latifah Pruitt for tuning in. And um, once again, I want to thank uh, the Active, the Active team. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Pruitts and Stay Realtor for letting us um, come here and, uh, you know, film here. And um, uh, like I said, once again, I'm, I'm not I'm reaching out to the world once again for you to be spiritually aware of everything that you have going on in your life that other people have went through the same thing and um, to encourage uh, the younger generation to put down the guns and uh, um, uh, start listening to your inner root, carbs and your nafs, your heart, your, your soul and your spirit to, to do better in life. Because the journey that you're going through or the path that you're going down, I can guarantee you it's somebody else that's already been down it. And we can tell you there's, there's not always a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, like I said, I was like the butterfly, my cocoon was the little cell block. And when they shut those gates, there's nothing in there but you. And when the spirit starts speaking to you and your nav starts speaking to you, I guarantee you it, it, it breaks you down so much that whenever you come out, you're a new, transformed, humble butterfly. Like Kendrick Lamar said, to pimp a butterfly. And I'm not gonna let you pimp this butterfly. I'm gonna be the power in manipulating people. And uh, once again, uh, Pruitt, thank, thank you. Thank you know you. what I'm saying, thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. May peace be upon uh, you, your family, children, brothers, sisters. Special shout out to David Street Side, Twelfth Street, North Side, South Side, East Side, West Side, <laughs> Active Tyler Marshall, Nacogdoches. Yes, you know yes. what I'm saying? All of East Texas. And uh, um, I see y'all on the next episode. And uh, ain't no telling what we'll be talking about then. You know what I'm saying? But until then, peace. Do, 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 do. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the act of stone. See my pants. Look at my bitches. Skinny jeans. Yeah, you better. <laughs> I still recording. I no, man. <laughs> That's how they rock them now.